<laughs> and, and you realize if you look at that from, from that perspective, okay, if I spent that on a video game back when you know, still, I'm not sure they even have arcades there still or not. But <laughs> you have the whole hour to yourself. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure they still do, but they, they, they used to have kind of arcades where the kids can't go and gamble until they're like 21. But families would go through there with people who are under 21. So or people who would be on road trip okay, and like a 19 year old with them. We're all set. But they can go play in the arcade. Uh -huh. So the good thing about having this all streamed is that we, uh, you can watch these remotely. The bad thing is that people don't, don't show up. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, you, have a, you have a sizable audience, Yang. So welcome. We're going to hear about anthropology today. So it's good, to, good for a change of uh, scene here. Anywhere? No. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Yang Zhou. I'm a second year PhD student in CSS. And um, today I'm going to present my paper, The Origin of Agriculture in the Paleogon Culture. And I'm using an agent-based modeling to study this part of the book. Um, so first I will go over my paper, my theories, my model, and my results. And then if I have time, I will try to run my model here. And if I still have time, I, um, I will try to talk about um, how to import uh, raise the data into NetLogo because a lot of people ask me about it. So um, the motivation of this paper is that um, the emergence of agriculture played an important role in human history as it allowed people to move from hunter-gathering to agriculture lifestyle. However, questions about how and why agriculture originated have remained controversial. So in this paper, I try to simulate the transition process using, using an agent-based model. And the model setting will be based on existing literatures. And here, this is an outline of what I do in this paper. I will explore the origin hypothesis of agriculture. And then I will study existing literatures or the origin of agriculture in the Pelican culture. And then I will use the canonical theory of social complexity as a framework to analyze the transition process um, in the Pelican culture. And then I will develop an agent-based model using the hypothesis, um, the archaeological <coughs> studies, and elevation data of the study area. And then I will an analyze the results and identify the key phases. So, um, for the literatures that I reviewed, um, people have many different hypotheses about how agriculture started. For example, the Oasis theory, um, they believe that uh, the climate got um, drier, so people were forced to live near the Oasis. And then they were forced to settle down, and that's how they start farming. But another study showed that the climate was actually getting wetter rather than getting drier. So um, this problem may not hold. And then there was another theory called um, demographic hypothesis. And it says that um, because the population was growing and people could not find enough food from the environment, so they have to develop agriculture to survive. And I think this, um, this theory makes most sense. Um, and then some people believe that no matter what the reason is, sufficient knowledge of plants was necessary for developing agriculture. So for this paper, I will try to simulate the origin of agriculture using um, two major conditions. One is the population growth, and the other one is um, increasing knowledge on plants. So for the reference is 2005 up there, is that was in respect to uh, the part of China you'd be talking about? Is that um, not specifically China. Okay, so this, this was the, like the whole northern climate's getting wetter? Um, like w which, which, part of the, which part of the world's getting wetter? I don't know okay. which specific area they're talking about, but not China. Okay. Is it specific to where our agriculture first started? The areas where we have the earliest indication of agriculture? Yeah, I don't know this so because most of your references are a little bit older here, 
it turns out that there's been a recent flowering of this literature in the last like five years. Mm. So in there's several papers in PNAS, uh, like 2008, 9, 10, but and which they, which actually take a, even a, 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 a maybe a third or fourth variation here, and the argument basically is that um, they they argue that it's it's naive to think that it's basically people uh, that agriculture was initially more fertile, and the the argument basically is that um, when people first came together, they actually uh, you increase the disease loading in, in people, and, 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 and initial initial varieties probably were not very very fertile also, so there is a there is a uh, fairly robust and I, I'll say it's, it's I was interested to see you jump into this because it's quite controversial it turns out uh, that uh, this new literature so I, I'll give you pointers to that after you, uh, after you're done. Okay, but just related to that actually, uh, Jim Jacob uh, in her book, uh, The Economy of Cities, I think she proposed a, uh, a scenario how actually agriculture um, uh, was um, born. It's, uh, her theory was like this. Uh, it's not, uh, it's first that there was trade, trade, trading, trading created at uh, trading centers. In the trading centers, actually, agriculture uh, started accidentally with an accident. Why? Because in the trading centers, uh, it was like a lot of goods were stored in the trading center, including animal, wild animals, including seeds, a variety of seeds. And by accident, you know, seeds could just fall on the ground sometimes. And people notice, oh, some actually they grow next year, actually. And uh, so that's how people accidentally discovered agriculture. And also with animals, and it was very interesting, I thought what she proposed, with animals, and uh, so because there are a lot of people brought in wild animals, right, to the trading center to trade for good, and then uh, they had to manage them, actually, alive. And then, so usually people would pick those wild ones and to kill. And gradually, actually, the, uh, the, those were mild, you know, uh, actually got to stay longer. And then naturally, they actually um, give birth. Mm. And that's how actually husbandry uh, started. She also talked about where and how, you know, this animal started, that domestic animal started. Uh, it was a very, it was a story that has a lot of details in it, but it, all ac it started accident, as accident. But actually, if you think about it, I thought it makes a lot of sense. It's just essentially, it's not like uh, agriculture first, and then cities. It's cities first, then agriculture. Also, there has been a lot of uh, evidence is suggesting that at the beginning, every, people still relied a lot on you know, other sources of food. Mm -hmm. Agriculture was really not sufficient at all, actually. Yeah. And, and uh, if you go back to some of the Neanderthal movement, mm -hmm. they, they found evidence that uh, some of these nomadic groups actually carried seed with them as they traveled from place to place. And whether, they, depending on where they wintered and summered, they would actually use some of these seeds and plants <coughs> They would have a set of crops already available to them when they settled for their, their time in, in their winter and summer homes. So I suspect there's a lot more co-evolution going on than, than our, our poor agent-based model. <laughs> but the agent-based model could be useful if there are a lot of theories we could implement, uh, you know, different theories into the agent-based, see if, you know, some may produce, <laughs> some may not actually produce agriculture, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, so there were many theories about how agriculture started, but in this model, I try to model that um, if population growth and the growth on the knowledge on plants will lead to um, the start of agriculture. And then this is the study area I picked. It's um, the Perigon culture in China. It's the red area on the map. Um, it was a group of Neolithic communities near the Middle Yellow River. And this is a picture of um, the old old place of the um, Pelican culture. And that photo on the bottom is where people are trying to find um, the leftovers of the Pelican. And then 
Um, this, I think the other things are some old tools that people used to use. And then um, I studied some literatures on the development of agriculture in the Pelican. Um, some people study that, um, Wang studied that um, they found some carbonized millet particles in that area. So they believe that um, foxtail millet is what um, people used to plant in that area. And then her points out that um, he studied the soil in the area. And then um, he thinks the soil is very soft and wet, which makes it possible for people to um, develop agriculture there. I'm sorry, what's yeah. millet? Is that a type of grass? Rice, I think it's a rice, but not the rice. Some of that. Okay. Is it edible? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a tiny, tiny green, yellowish color. Yeah. Oh, kind of like quinoa or something? Like a pussy. How do you call pussy? Couscous. Couscous. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, oh like that. Well, couscous is made from flour. Yeah. It doesn't grow. It's just grow. tiny, like, you know. No. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, and then. Um, I find it interesting that Lee and Ru, they studied some folk tales from the book um, Classic of Poetry about farming. And they, um, they learned about some stories where people found a tasty plant while they were gathering food, and then they tried to plant it. Um, these early people experienced a lot of failures, but um, they learned more and more about the plants during this process, and then they were able to start farming. Um, and then Yang suggests that the transition to agriculture in Perigang can be explained by population growth. Um, he thinks that plants and animals that were traditionally uh, gathered or hunted decrease because of the uh, population growth, and then people were forced to develop agriculture. And then um, I developed a framework using the canonical theory of social complexity. Um, at, the f at first, we have a very simple society. And then there was population growth and, and then insufficient natural food. Also, the knowledge on plants was increasing. And then people recognized the need of finding new source of food. Some people become farmers while hunting gathering remained the major source of um, obtaining food. And then later on, more and more people become farmers, and then agriculture has become the majority method for producing food. At the same time, settlement and then cultivating um, specialists occurred. And then population continued to grow, and the need for more food persisted. At the same time, knowledge on plants keep increasing. And at the end, um, there is an uh, agricultural society. And this is uh, uh, the user interface of my model. It was built using NetLogo 5.3. Um, on the left-hand side, I have the buttons to start the model running, and then some sliders to change the parameters. And then in the middle, I have the display to show um, the behavior of the agents. And then on the right-hand side, um, I have the outputs, some, including some charts to plot the um, knowledge on plants, population, the number of plants, and the number of settled and moving people. And um, at the end, I will explain more. And then this is the environment I used um, it is the area where most of the Perigang uh, communities were located in. And then um, it's um, 250 by 250 pacos. And then each paco in this model represents an area of uh, 100 meters by 100 meters. Um, I'm using the elevation data to build a, la a landscape. And then I use the elevation to calculate this, the slope. 
and I use slope in my model so that um, when people start the farm, they will choose the area that is not so steep, so more flat. And I have four types of agents, people, plants, animals, and crops. Um, and this is a decision tree of the people. At the start, they will check if the, is a, uh, he's a farmer or not. If he's not, um, he will search, try to search for food within a radius. And then um, if he's able to find animals or plants, um, he will eat it. And then if um, he gathered plants, his knowledge on plants will increase. And then if he cannot find any food, he will try to uh, start farming. But only when he has enough knowledge on plants, then he can start to um, start to farm. Otherwise, he cannot find any food and he may die. And if someone is a farmer, he can cultivate crops and then feed up to three people because um, I assume that agriculture is more efficient than hunter-gathering. And then he can also pass the knowledge on farming to other people. And then people fed from farmers become free from producing food. Also, in this model, people can produce babies. If they are um, female and larger than 15 years old, there's a 13% chance um, she can produce a baby. And the agents will die if they are older than 30 years old because um, I think according to some studies, that's how long people at that time live. Okay. And this is a table of the input uh, variables. The global, er uh, the global variables include the number of plants, the plant growth rate, so um, up in each period, the plants will grow again, and then the number of animals, the initial population, for the people, they have age, knowledge on plants, um, searching radius, that's the radius within which they can search for food, and then the probability of pregnancy. And then for the environment, I have elevation and slope. Uh, so this is the result at 30 years, and this is the number of an average of 100 runs. So I run the model for 100 times and then took the average. Um, the green line represents the number of farmers. The blue line on top represents the population. And then the purple line represents the number of hunter-gatherers. And the red line represents the number of hungry people. The um, the lower blue line represents the number of people who are free from gathering food. Uh, we can see that the population was growing at first and then slowed down because some people got hungry. Um, and then at some point, maybe between 10 or 15 years, um, we can see some people started to farm. But um, hunter-gathering was still the majority way to get food. And then at 50 years, um, the number of farmers continued to increase, and then the number of hunter-gatherers uh, continued to decrease, and then there was almost equal number of both groups. And then at 100 years, we can see that um, the farmers have um, the farmers have took over and. Um, there were very little number of hunter and gatherers, and then the population was growing again. Also, this is a display of, um, at 100 years. It shows that um, there were some clusters on the map. That means um, people are forming maybe some communities to live. And this is a graph of the um, the number of people that are settled versus moving over time. Um, and I did some sensitivity analysis using three scenarios. 
The first one is that um, I increased the wild plant's growth rate to 5%, keeping all other parameters the same. And on the left hand side is the percentage of farmers over the um, entire population. And we can see that um, agriculture developed slower in this case, but the population is higher. And I think um, the reason is that people are able to find more food from the environment and they don't have to develop agriculture. But still, um, but still there was a high percentage of farmers at the end. And the second scenario is very similar to the first one. Instead of increasing the growth rate, I increased the number of wild plants. And the result was similar. Um, agriculture developed slower and the population is larger. Um, in scenario three, the, res uh, the search radius is decreased to 500 meters and then keeping all other parameters the same. Um, in this one, it's more, um, it's more interesting because we can see that there is a higher percentage of farmers. However, the population is much smaller. And I think it's because people cannot find sufficient food in such a small area. So they were forced. Mm, it was more urgent for them to develop agriculture in this case. But since they cannot find food, many of them died and the population gets very small. So um, to summarize this paper, I explored the origin of agriculture and attempts to address how the hunter-gatherers societies transformed into agriculture societies. I try to address this problem by developing an agent-based model to simulate the transition process. And the model is able to generate the desired results, including the key phases in the framework. The paper provides a new approach to understand the transition from hunter-gatherer uh, hunter to agricultural society, although um, there were still many other hypotheses. And this paper cannot prove this, which one is um, right or wrong. So um, now I can I can try to run my model. Um, so I I can initialize the map using setup, <coughs> and then um, the animals are the white dots, and the plants are these green dots that are randomly distributed on the map. And if we hide them, we can see that I create um, 500 people and then randomly, um, randomly put them into small groups on this map. Um, yeah, and then I can run it. So now your, your agents are hunting. Mm. Uh, primarily hunting for the first few and then yeah. what what allows them to transition over to farmers is it just the lack of availability of nearby mm. fox or um, if they cannot find food and they have enough knowledge on plants okay right. yeah because I, s I assume that if they, um, they find some plants to eat their, in their knowledge on plants will increase so their interaction with the environment counts as their experience. Mm. Their interaction with plants counts as their experience with plants. Okay. But yeah. there are also some farmers already um, at the beginning. Is at that the right? beginning, there's no farmer because no farmer at all. Yeah, yeah. Yellow represents farmer, so at the beginning, there's no farmer, but some hunter gatherers. Um, this purple line represents hunters uh, or gatherers. <laughs> All of the agents learn at the same rate based on their experience with plants, so there's no heterogeneity between at the people. Um, when an agent is created at the beginning, um, I think I use a uniform distribution to draw the knowledge on plants. 
but when they uh, when they run, it's the same speed. Okay. Is there exchange of knowledge between um, agents? Right now, no. But later no, on, when someone become farmer, he can teach other people around him. That would speed up agriculture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you do have that in your code, or um, you? I have it for the farmers, but not for the hunter gatherers. So farmers can share knowledge. Yeah. 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 So. Um, so. So do you see? Have you done a plot to see if it accelerates their growth of knowledge? Mm -hmm. So you're more farmers, so the more quickly they learn, and so that there's a speeding up of that. Um, the knowledge actually, um, according to this. Yeah, um, at the end we can look at the graph of knowledge on plants. Actually, when it reaches some level, it doesn't go up anymore. And it's I think like the, this kind. Of yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I will turn off the update to run it faster. So this orange line is the population, and then. We can see that at some point the, pop, um, the number of hunter gatherers was decreasing, and then the number of um, the number of farmers was increasing, and then <coughs> and then the knowledge on plants is increasing too, but at some point I think it's <coughs> not increasing anymore. Because because the because the, because your spatial grid is saturated at that point with. With farmers, not uh, it's reached like an, an equilibrium or, or a stationary state, not an equilibrium. I think it's because people die. Oh. Because, uh, yeah, they can only run when they're alive, and then if they die, that's a that's a um, and this is the average. So the average is up around 15. That means maybe all the people have a lot of knowledge on the planet. So each individual has an upward bound of how much they can learn because they only get to be so old. Yeah. And yeah. so. So thirty plus that initial right. knowledge. Okay. Yeah. Question. Yeah. So they're gaining knowledge. Um, continually, the, the transition from gatherers to planters is smooth through the whole thing. You don't have any revelation of connection between seeds and the next generation of plants. Mm -hmm. Did you go so many years as uh, just hunter-gatherers and then somebody notices <coughs> the connection between the seeds and, and then that starts to spread? Or th the way you're modeling it, it sounds like everybody slowly makes a transition from hunter-gatherer to uh, their knowledge is, is slowly growing rather than an individual or different people cross a threshold and discover the connection between mm -hmm. seeds and, and future plants. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's more like the later one in this one. So people, everyone can discover planning. Okay. Yeah. So there's no, no heterogeneity in their recognition of the, the ability to plant or mm -hmm. no. the connection between the two. But people only begin to plan when they're hungry, and they cannot gather food from the but, land. But that, that's where my, my problem is, because how do they make the decision to plant rather than eat the seed if they're hungry? They're going to eat their seed. Because yeah. they got to live, and it's going to take 70 days or so for the, for the plant to come to harvest. Yeah, that's true. So they got to survive that time. Some interesting questions. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, this is the model. Also, I have this graph. Um, this, The blue line is the number of moving people. And then the brown line is the number of people who have settled. Um, so we also see that more and more people are settled, while at the be um, at the beginning most people are moving. So that uh, so that speaks to the formation of cities, right? Because mm. they're settling, they don't need to move anymore, so they start gathering larger concentrations. Why why do they concentrate? 
Why don't they scatter to have good land to grow on? Um, yeah, actually, actually, if I hire plants, most people gather around, and I think it's because if someone plant, he can fit other people around him because in the model, so maybe people don't have to move around anymore, and they can settle near the farmers. Near the food. Mm. Okay. You don't model water availability, I presume. Mm, what? Water is near this area, but mm, here I didn't model the water. Okay. How or, did you or build? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you don't model weather. No. Okay. Um, one growing season or continuous? One uh, How are there four seasons, um, oh. and they only have one crop each year, and oh. they have to maintain it? For the store it for a period of time, or is it? Are you doing it continuous? Um, so because the fox tail lilies is one crop per year, and I'm modeling one period equals to one year, so that's how. Okay, so you do it over the whole year. Yeah, so that's what once. Okay. Okay, so um, I think that's it for the model. Do you have other questions? So. Uh, Say again. So the why the clusters are the way they are is it really it's really just uh, a side effect of the fact that there's food available. So that that's why the clusters are the way they are. Um, I'm guessing. Um, my guess is yes, okay. but I didn't program anything that people mm -hmm. have to gather around. But I you have a distance that they go to look for food, mm -hmm. so that would affect. Yeah, the there's clusters a radius. Also, exactly. Um, th there is another uh, thing um, that I find really cool. So the first one is the concentration of your agents. So it <coughs> goes along with, I don't know, some paper or documentary I watched or something like that said that precisely what you're saying is when, uh, when people started farming, there was no longer any need to be so mobile. So they started gathering in smaller places and that put together the first formation of cities. The other thing is, your agents are becoming idle, free, right? Free is idle, they're not doing anything? Yeah, um, no, they're not gathering food or farming. So they're not gathering food or farming, but they're not hungry either, otherwise they'd be red, right? Yeah. Right. So right. they're living off of what other people are producing. And, and more spare time. And more spare time. So isn't that the, the first indicators of like civilization is we can farm for more, pe less of us have to focus on food gathering, so more of us can focus on skilled activities like making things, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So that you also produce that, which is pretty cool. But if you let it go for a long time, does it just, it just blows up, the population just blows up? Mm. I mean, does, it have, does, it have a, does the landscape have a natural yeah. carrying capacity? Or? Um, no, because later on, maybe some other issue will occur but my model doesn't model the maybe the next issue that will occur but so is the uh, is the knowledge about the plants is, it, is there any bound from above i mean it, basically you're increasing the productivity of the yields from the plants but it, is that bounded um do you mean it is the knowledge bounded yeah um no but people can only live 30 years so they can only have 30 plus the initial knowledge how uh, can, can, can farmers grow more and more plants over time? So um, the amount of food that they can grow every year, does that increase? Um, or they can only grow the same amount of food every year? Same amount of food. Uh, That's more than what they uh, need. Rob, I think that, I think this graph, the population graph, yeah. that's just, that's not the active population, that's just the absolute value of the population that you've had over all the time cycles, right? Mm -hmm. Because your model oh, would have Oh, that's not the uh, media population. Yeah, that's because th there would have to be a carrying capacity. It's a it's a finite space. You think so, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I see that, and the free people are fluctuating a lot, but that, but that's, that's not appearing in the figures. Uh, this isn't the free people. This line. Right, but, 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 but is it is that's the total free people who have lived forever? Um, no, 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 free people also oh. die. But maybe it's too small, so we are not able to see. 
Because it appears to be fluctuating a lot up there. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Because three people can die too. But I think the uh, the earlier question I think Rob was asking is, your um your you've got a limited s spatial so th at, at some point there should be no more farm over land. But I guess you've got yes. enough space in there. Yeah. To yeah. where your model will go on for a very long time before it achieves its carrying capacity. Oh yeah, that's right. Um, so for one cell, only one farmer can farm there. Okay. They cannot have multiple farmer farming in the same land. And you have a lot of cells. Yeah. But so if you accel accelerate it, maybe we can go a lot faster. It does does the population in fact saturate though, or, or not? Does it? Because yeah, this is just this is going to exponential growth. Mm. Take up right? I mean, the, the log of that population would be linear somehow, right? So it's. Yeah. Right now, I stopped. My code is written that it stops at a hundred ticks. Oh. <coughs> yeah, it would need to, it would need to flatten off at some point in order. F yeah. For the. Yeah. For us to know, but it seems like there's just a lot of cells. All that yellow is the used up farm space, but all the black is the unused. Yeah. So this can go on for a long time. Yeah, that's right. When a farmer dies, does another farmer come take their land? Um. Not necessarily, but if those three people cannot find new source of food, and they have, um, and the farmer has taught him the knowledge, then he may become a farmer too. But they don't necessarily take that same plot of land. No, maybe no one takes it. Yeah. And they don't farm out the land. Um, they don't. It's not. It's not the slash and burn grow crops here for 5, 10, 15 years, and then you have to move because you've taken everything out of the ground. No, they are not that. And there's, where, where do the wild animals or husbandry go? Do they start e eating the crops as well, or do they disappear? Uh, in this model, I didn't model um, the animals. Okay. Because I think it would be very similar to plan the, plan, um, the farming thing. If I use the plan theory, so I didn't model that plan. I think also some of the clustering behavior might be due to the fact that your agents are instantiated in groups. Right? Yeah. I can't remember for plants. You also had some kind of random distribution, but you okay, grouped them a little right. bit too. When you went in the when the in the initial model, mm -hmm. you grouped people oh, and yeah, randomly yeah. placed them, yeah, yeah, and then you right. did the same thing with the plants too. The plants is not grouped; it are all randomly distributed okay. on the entire map. Yeah. It'd be really interesting to plot. The old, like the, the end result on your original plotting of the people and see if that matches with your initial clusters. Are there any demographers in the room? I mean, I, th I think that the, I, I remember going to talk one time where they, they call it they call scenarios like this where basically you start out with a low population and you never reach any real constraints. They call this a Garden of Eden scenario, mm -hmm. uh, where you know just things everything grows up exponentially and there's no constraints that are hit and then there's there are benchmarks that are known like you know how fast can a human population expand uh, there, are, I mean, there are a variety of things that are known about um, I, th I think in this one you would hit a limit because eventually all the land will be full and you can't have any more people after that yeah. it's just that, that I mean this is um, this is a river civilization so that it will you know they'll continue to exist and you know it's New, new new nutrients get washed down every year with the floods, so the, the soil doesn't isn't okay. worked out. Yeah, I, but I think, I mean, I, I I think if you add more properties, I think you'll you'll get you'll that exponential growth will go down. If you add where water is, if you add arid versus 
farmable land. Uh, if you model like more properties, I think your numbers will start go down significantly. But I also think your agents are really tiny, yeah. and your space is really huge. So this could be a representation of the entire Earth, as as far as the agents are concerned, right? So it could be that, you well, know. Well, what, this is what two fifty by two fifty. Yeah, two fifty by two fifty. And each spot is one hectare, so I mean it's. 625, 6.6 and a quarter million? Or 625 thousands? Yeah, because maybe, that's, 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 so maybe that this is not the most interesting time to look at for the evolution of the society. Maybe that you would imagine that in the pre agricultural epoch, it's, a, it's at a carrying capacity for hunting and gathering. Mm -hmm. so you, you're, at, you're at the carrying capacity for hunting and gathering. And then you progressively introduce agriculture. How do you move from you know, one plateau to a new one? And maybe that you just, you're just starting it out at such a small population that we're not seeing the interesting transition yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. But it may also be that you, where you, it may not be possible to do 100,000 agents spatially within that logo. I don't know. It may be just a well, well, she, she could also achieve the same desired effect by reducing the size. The size of it. And aren't we also only at 120 years? Is that the duration? Uh, yeah, right now we're at 120. Okay, so four, four generations. Mm -hmm. Between yeah, each other for 30 yeah. years, so. Yeah, approximately. And do we know, he said that this, this society was existed for about 2,000 years, right? So do you know how, how long did it take for agriculture to come into it? Is there any idea about that? I think it's a very long time. Jamie just said it. Hunter gathers was what, like 10,000 years before. Uh -huh. well, the architecture. I think one of the limits you might have is if you have two people closer together, you start introducing diseases yep. that you wouldn't have if, when, if you're in a more open space, you're not communicating diseases like you would be when you're in a tight area. Yeah. Also, uh, in our in our modeling of, of hunters and gatherers in East Africa, um, the weather cycles um, had significant effects on grain growth and population, and it kept knocking them back down again <coughs> when they had droughts, which occurred from time to time. Um, that may be part of the Garden of Eden that that yeah. they're never having to deal with that. In our model in the Anasazi, we definitely had the, the, the spatial variation in the soil quality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you want to, you know, you just use a, if it, was, if it was the U.S., you'd be able to say that's, you know, every, every, every hectare of land in the U.S. has the soil quality, the soil type is known. Then there's a mean performance of it and a variability also. Mm -hmm. And so you could, uh, if, if, if in fact this you know, soil type was known here, you could, you would be able to look up those data and then get a sense of how how how, uh, how much variation you'd expect in across the landscape. But wouldn't that be pretty consistent in a river in a river civilization? So it would be pretty much consistent? Uh, yeah. is this, so would, does this land flood every year? Um, is it that is it that, that near the river? 200, how many miles? 160, 160 miles across? Sorry, that just blew the whole. Uh, that's, that's a little large to flood. People won't be happy with that. Well, um, periodically, probably. I can offer that we could I could spend some time talking about what we did in East Africa and how we modeled because our our design was that our our households could grow up could develop into being hunters or gatherers or a, a fraction in, in between, and we dropped them in different areas, and based on the weather patterns, the availability, uh, the, the quality of the land based on satellite imaging, um, they, they developed. And the nice validation that we had was we had anthropologist descriptions of how the people made a living. And we could show that for the three sample places that we picked, they did develop to, to be what we expected them to be in the, in the local area. Um, and we did the, 
it's many of the same things. But we did have weather, we did have soil variability. Um, and we had a longer lifespan, <laughs> um, but, but similar kinds of things. Uh, is that uh, more recent? Oh no, this this is current. This is this is current, so I don't have yeah. the, the, the that data. Um, but some of it's described out in the hallway, and uh, I can talk through the code. Sure. Okay, let's thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We we did see carrying capacity effects, which is where the weather, the droughts, really <laughs> knocked it back. Are you going to continue with this model? You're going to go do something else? Yeah, but I remember on the three or four Did you, did you, uh, in their survivability, based on, on crops, did you do it based on?